Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Heavenly Father, bless, I pray the reading of your word, the preaching to follow. Lord, give me very good clarity of thought. Focus on the task and the text. Do your perfect work through your perfect word. Teach us what we need to know. Mold us in the image of Christ. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The date was March the 12th, 1928. The time was just before midnight. The place was the San Francis Dam in the San Francisco Canyon, about 30 miles northwest of Los Angeles. It was a pretty new dam, having been completed just two years earlier in 1926. From the very beginning, there were some small cracks and leaks observed in it, but those were dismissed by William Mulholland, the chief engineer of the project, as nothing to worry about. On March the 7th, 1928, it was filled to capacity for the first time, and Mulholland inspected it and proclaimed it to be safe. But just before midnight on March the 12th, the dam's massive concrete wall collapsed, sending billions of gallons of water rushing down the canyon toward the Pacific Ocean. The towns of Castaic Junction, Fillmore, Barsdale, and Peru were flooded. More than 1,000 houses were damaged or destroyed. The official death toll was estimated to be 450, but the likely number was way higher since many victims' bodies were never discovered and there was no accounting for the transient farm workers and the illegal migrants who perished in the flood. An investigation into the disaster concluded that it had been caused primarily by the unsuitability of the San Francisco rock for supporting a dam and a reservoir to begin with. In other words, the foundation wasn't suitable and only got worse when all the weight was added to it with deadly results. You don't have to look around too much in our own land to see the parallel. There's a greatness that many societies around the world used to have and that America used to have an abundance. And everywhere you look, including here, it's going what? And the reason for that is because the foundations are being destroyed. There are certain things that societies used to be able to build on, and those things have been intentionally and savagely attacked for decades and decades by the devil and those that serve him with a specific point of bringing good societies to ruin. Now that thought's been on my mind much of late, so I've been preaching on some foundational truths and will continue to do so, Lord willing, for several weeks on Sunday night. Some things I don't want you to ever have degraded in your mind or your thinking or your home. Some truths about men and women, life itself, work and wealth, crime and punishment, and much more. Again, we're simply calling this foundational truths. The first message was truth is. The second was right and wrong. The third was life or death and covered the horrible sin of abortion. Go to Acts chapter 4, if you would, please. This fourth message will be capitalism and the other isms, and it'll deal with a society-wrecking philosophy of socialism. Preacher, why would you cover such a thing? Because we have kids in this church that go to public schools and some which will go to universities, and they're going to be taught that something horrible is actually something good, and they're going to be lied to, and if people believe it, it's going to wreck our society. And if our society's wrecked, the greatest missions to sending society in the history of the world will cease to exist and will cease to send missions, and that's the devil's goal all along. In Acts chapter 4, let's cover verses 32 through 35 very quickly. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down to the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. There's been a great deal of talk recently about something called socialism, especially on college campuses where it's really popular because professors are leftist hack activists and many of the kids are too naive to know better. There's also on these campuses a lot of praise for a few other isms, namely communism and Marxism. Not capitalism, though. That one routinely gets savaged. Now, words mean things. They have definitions. And all four of these words that I just mentioned have very specific definitions. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about them. Quickly, let me give you the definitions of these words. Socialism is a political theory advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. It's a system of society or group living in which there is no private property, a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. 
Capitalism is an economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods, by investments that are determined by private decisions, and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods that are determined mainly by competition in a free market. Marxism is the political, economic, and social principles and policies advocated by Karl Marx, especially a theory and practice of socialism including the labor theory of value, dialectical materialism and class struggle, and the dictatorship of the proletariat until the establishment of a classless society. Those are important words. We'll get to them shortly. Then there's communism. That's a theory advocating the elimination of private property. It's a system in which goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed. These are the four basic theories of how society ought to operate, especially in regards to property. Now please notice that three of them are very similar and one of them is very different. The three that are very similar are socialism, Marxism, and communism. And spoiler alert, when it gets right down to it, they don't just look the same, they are the same, they're just in different stages. But that leaves one that's very different, that of capitalism. America, at least in theory, is a capitalistic society. But when you watch the news and you watch interviews of brilliant Hollywood types, please tell me, do those newscasters and Hollywood types view capitalism as positively or negatively? They view it negatively. And since the other three systems are the things left as options, they view those as positive, especially socialism, which is usually viewed as the most benign of the three. Believe me when I tell you that socialism is becoming very popular today. Everywhere people are abandoning capitalism in favor of it. And I want to put your thinking caps on, and I want you to notice that given with the definitions given, there's a big difference between capitalism and the other three. And the word private is where you find that difference, especially private. Private property. Say, preacher, what is private property? How many of you have a house? That's private property. How many of you have a car? It's private property. How many of you, don't raise your hands on this one, have a gun? <laughs> I know y'all do. It, it's, it's private property. If you have any cash, that's private property. If you have a boat, that's private property. If you have a ping pong table, that's private property. We're all getting old. We have, we have pickleball paddles now. Those are private property, okay? Anything that you own yourself is private property. Notice also according to the definition how exactly those goods come to you. They come by competition and a free exchange in the free market. In other words, in a capitalistic society, the harder you work and the better you do, the more you get. And it's all freedom-based. If I make something you want, you're free to buy it, but never forced to buy it and vice versa. So both of us ends up happy when we do business because otherwise we wouldn't do business to begin with. In capitalism, hard work and success actually mean something. In all the other isms, hard work and success mean nothing because everything gets put into one big pot and given out equally. Now, that's great if you're lazy. It's not so great if you're a hard worker. But regardless, lots of people advocate those other isms. Keep your Bible open to Acts chapter 4. Let me give you some examples from recent history. In the Occupy Wall Street protest a few years ago, college-age kids were holding up young socialist banners and marching through the street. A few years ago, Roseanne Barr, that genius, gave an interview in which she said that a banker who has more than $100 million should either be forced to give it back or be beheaded. But then somebody happened to mention her, hey, I read that you have $80 million, and she cursed them like a sailor because you're not supposed to notice little hypocritical matters like that. The push for universal health care was modeled on Britain's system of government, which is socialist in nature. When our government under President Obama appointed a pay czar to determine what CEOs were allowed to make, that's an example of socialism. Recently, BLM and Antifa protesters built a guillotine out in front of Jeff Jeff Bezos' house. He's the CEO of Amazon. The message they were sending is that it was unfair he has so much, and they intend to take it from him, even if they have to cut off his head to do it. That's today's young socialist in action. Liberal filmmaker Michael Moore gave an interview in which he said, the money that these billionaires have is a public resource. It should be taken from them and spread out equally. And in case you're sitting there thinking, hey, that doesn't sound too bad, you may want to be careful because shortly thereafter, someone else said, hey, that's not quite far enough. If that's the way we need to do things, what we really need to realize is that IRAs and retirement accounts are also public resources that should be distributed equally. Now all of a sudden you're going, hey, whoa, er That's a little bit too far, but who gets to decide too far once you've crossed that line? 
On October the 5th, 2011, the news showed again the Occupy Wall Street protesters. One was holding up a sign saying capitalism is a violent monopoly. More recently, leftvoice.org published a column titled, The Fight to Abolish the Police is the Fight to Abolish Capitalism. In it, they have such gems as police exist because capitalism needs them. So please get it very clearly established in your mind that the goal of everything you see happening in the street is not social justice. The goal of everything you see happening in the street has nothing to do with police reform. It has nothing to do with addressing racism. The goal is to completely do away with capitalism and put socialism in its place. And spoiler alert, that has nothing to do with equality or equity and has everything to do with useful idiots granting tyrannical power to a handful of overlords without even realizing it. But go ahead and look at Acts chapter 4. I'm going to have you look here because people who believe in socialism point to this passage to try to prove it. Acts 4, 32 through 35, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down to the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, in this passage, we supposedly see a socialist system of government. Now, put on your thinking caps. Let's look at the text carefully, and let me show you why that's an absurd view. First of all, where was the government in all of this? There was, there was no government involved in any of this. Number two, it was all strictly voluntary, 100%. Number three, it was also temporary. Now let's look at those things. First of all, the people that believe there was no gov- the, the, the fact there's no government involved in it. People who believe in the other isms really believe heavily that government should be involved to make it happen. Do you remember the definition of Marxism? It was the dictatorship of the proletariat until the establishment of a classless society. Notice those words, dictatorship of the proletariat. Who are these proletariat people that they believe should have a dictatorship? Hint, some of you but not all of you. The proletariat referred to factory workers. How many of you happen to be factory workers? Any factory workers here? We got one, two, three, four factory workers, five factory workers. You guys are the proletariat. Congratulations. Give yourselves a hand and pat on the back of metal. This is the proletariat. Now, we love these men, don't we? But are we really interested in letting them have a dictatorship over all of us? Really, seriously? I mean, I've known these guys for a while. I love these guys, but I'm not letting Brother Keener have a dictatorship over me. I'm telling you, he would have me out there in the yard picking his blueberry for him, all, all kinds. Of, I'm just telling you, man. He'd have me taking care of his dogs and cleaning up everything. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. But this is what they suggest. The proletariat is to be in charge. The factory workers are to be in charge. They're to have a dictatorship. And by the way, if you think that the brains behind this idea are going to let the factory workers ultimately have the power anyway, you're crazy. They were just useful in the process. When the Bolshevik Revolution began in the USSR, there was an American who was the forefront of promoting it because he believed all the drivel about the empowerment of the factory workers, the freedom that would be produced. His name was Max Eastman. He was a journalist, and he wrote in impassioned terms about how wonderful socialism was. But years of studying the actual effects of it led him to write a book that he never intended to write. The book that this former reddest of the red, in his words, wrote is called Reflections on the Failures of Socialism. I have that book in my library. Undeniable evidence from a man who was a diehard socialist cheerleader turned complete, turned him completely against it because he saw it producing the opposite of what everybody claimed it would produce. He realized that such a system went against fundamental human nature and therefore it required a huge, nearly all-powerful government to make it happen. It didn't produce freedom. It didn't produce utopia. It didn't even produce equitable distribution of wealth. It produced poverty, enslavement, and death. You say, he was some fundamentalist Christian. He was an atheist. Till the day he died, he was an atheist. But he was an honest man, and he looked at this and realized, this is a disaster. I've got to warn everybody. Listen, the brains will always find a way to manipulate the proletariat into doing what they want them to do. You say, but preacher, surely no one seriously believes that the Bible gives government the right to make people put everything in a pot and give it away. Really? Listen to this excerpt from an article by a guy named David Chandler. Is concern for the poor to be simply a private matter to be handled by charity or does it have anything to do with politics or government? 
The Bible calls upon the rulers to create a just society. In a democracy, we are the rulers. We have the power to make the rules. The actions of the nation are extensions of our own actions. By our active participation or passive consent, we share responsibility for what our nation does in our name. We've inherited a system that works efficiently to produce tremendous wealth, but fails to distribute that wealth equitably. It neglects the poor and corrupts the rich. On both counts, it destroys community. A decent life for all is a matter of simple justice, not charity. There are remedies that will make the system work better in the interest of all the people, but it takes active political involvement to bring them about. I hope you understood that. What that guy just said was, it's not enough for you to give to others what you can afford out of your own generosity. The government has to step in and take what you have and give it away for you. And he claims that this idea is biblical. But when you look at Acts chapter 4, it was clearly all voluntary, no government involved at all. In fact, look at the very next chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, because they stop at chapter 4, conveniently not going into chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? Look at this. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Did you notice what Peter admitted to? After they sold this land, the money was still in their own power. They could have done with it whatever they chose to do. The problem wasn't what they gave or didn't give. The problem was that they lied about what they gave. So you see what happened in Acts chapter 4 was voluntary. You can see there was no government involvement at all. And you can also see that it was temporary. This situation existed for a very short time for a very specific need. The church had burst into existence almost overnight. It had gone in one message from 100 or so members to more than 3,000. 3,000 people came to Jerusalem, lost, got saved, and were sticking around. They didn't have homes there. They didn't have possessions there. Somehow they had to be provided for, and God's people voluntarily handled that need. But within a very short time, that system was no longer needed. People got on their feet, and Paul gave this instruction. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12. And that you study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. Paul told these people, many of whom were getting used to sitting around and being provided for, that they were to get up and work and provide for themselves. He then went on a bit later to say this, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 through 12, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, That was with quietness, they work and eat their bread. Notice these people were commanded to work and to eat their own bread. And Paul said, if they won't work, they're not even allowed to eat. A few years ago, there was a news story. It's one of those news stories that make you want to punch through a screen somewhere. One of those news stories that make you want to physically reach through it and grab somebody and drag them into your living room and beat the living daylights out of them. News crew followed a guy in California. He's a surfer, all right, man. Likes to surf, likes to ride the waves. He's about 24, 25 years old. He gets up in the morning, grabs a surfboard, goes out there to the California coast, surfs through the day, all day. Night, puts the surfboard up, goes to a grocery store, cameras follow him around. He buys steak and lobster night after night after night after night. Go home and grill some steak and lobster. Using vouchers from the government that come from your tax dollars. He doesn't work because he doesn't have to work. He's not rich. He's found a way to get on the government dole so that all of you who work jobs, you're paying for his lobster. You're paying for his steak. You're paying for his surfing. That is why America is leaning more socialist than capitalist now because people have found out they can surf and have steak and lobster and somebody that's working in a factory somewhere has got to pay for it for them. Paul said if they won't work, they shouldn't even eat. That's still a biblical principle that ought to be practiced in our day. Now, the root of the differences between socialism, communism, and Marxism on one side and capitalism on the other is this thing called private property. In order to determine which system is biblical and right, 
we need to determine if private property was allowed and if some ended up with more or less than others. So grab your Bibles. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Let's begin to look and see. And by the way, you say, preacher, about socialism thing, about free bread sounds so good. Have you ever wondered why socialist countries have so many bread lines? Because when everything's for free, people stop working and there's never enough to go around. Notice Job chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Notice Job. He was perfect, upright, godly. God himself said this is a perfect and an upright man and he was also way richer than everybody else around him. Now, will godliness always mean that you get rich? No. But what this passage does teach is that riches don't mean you're ungodly. Job was filthy, stinking rich, way more so than others around him, and God called him a perfect and an upright man. Roseanne Barr wouldn't think so. Michael Moore wouldn't think so. Joe Biden wouldn't think so. AOC wouldn't think so. Bernie wouldn't think so. But God did. Who else went in the Bible that came rich? Well, there's Abraham, there was David, there was Solomon, there was Joseph of Arimathea, men that God highly blessed. Others around them had less, but God spoke highly of each one of them. How about Joseph, the son of Jacob? Joseph's a man of whom not one negative word is said in Scripture. Joseph got filthy rich while others around him didn't. But Joseph has spoken of the Bible consistently positive with no negative. So you see several examples of good and godly men who did in fact end up with more than others. Go to Proverbs 27. Even in the principles laid out in Scripture, though, we can see private property rights expounded just by principle, not just by example. Proverbs 27, 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Now look at the biblical principle. Whoever does the work to grow, tend to, fertilize, protect, nurture the fig tree, he'll be the one to eat the fruit. That's capitalism. Socialism and the other isms require a man to grow, tend to, fertilize, protect, nurture the fig tree, then make him give the figs away to people who sat at home on their tails while he did the work. Here's another one, Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is, what's that word? Ah! Profit, it's an evil word. It's a biblical word. In all labor there's profit. By the talk of lips tendeth only to penury, meaning poverty. Profit's, pro- profit's not evil at all. When you work, you make a profit. When you could work but choose instead to run your mouth, you starve. Here's another one, First Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings 21, beginning in verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I'll give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came to his house heavy and displeased, because the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him for he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my father's. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said to her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I'll give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, Look at this, I will not give thee, what's the next two words? My vineyard. No, Naboth called that piece property. My property. He refused to give it away. He refused to even sell it. It was his private property. Naboth was a capitalist. Ahab and Jezebel were the socialists. They so strongly believed in the power of government to take private property away from people that they murdered the man to make it happen. We won't have you turn there, but you can see the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 1 through 15, where God has Jeremiah buy a piece of property, deed it, and make it his. Uh, Jeremiah's offered the opportunity to buy this. There's this elaborate legal process they went through to make sure that he would have it and forever have it. It was his and his alone. You find the same thing in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. There's a woman who has a house. She has a piece of property. She has to leave the country for a while due to the famine. She comes back after seven years. Somebody's taken her land. She demands it back, and the king acknowledged that she was right. Her land was given back to her along with all that it produced because they believed in private property. Private property rights is one of the main defining characteristics of a civilized nation. i got a question. How many of you believe that your house should belong to you, not everyone in general? How many of you believe that your paycheck should belong to you, not to everybody in general? How many of you believe your vehicle should belong to you, not to everybody in general? 
What you're telling me is that you believe in capitalism. And that's good because it's biblical. All through the Bible, we find the demand that people work hard, invest wisely, and take care of themselves. That is capitalism. Does it result in inequality? Yeah, absolutely. Is it wrong? Absolutely not. Let me illustrate. There are 10 kids in a school class, and parents, one of those 10 kids is yours. Your child works really hard. Your child comes home and studies late into the night. I mean, they give up activities that would be fun for them to do. They study and they study because they really want to ace this final exam, and you are so proud of them for their study. They take the final exam, and your kid makes 100 on the final exam. Well, the other nine kids are very lazy. They goof off, play video games late into the night, don't study, don't even try, and they all make a 10 on their final exam. That's inequality. But is it wrong for your kid to have a higher score than the others? No, because your kid worked harder than they did. But if you believe in socialism, here's the result you get. All the points from all the kids have to be pulled together, and that makes 190. They have to be shared evenly. And that means that the lazy kid all had their scores raised from a 10 to a 19, and your kid had his score lowered from a 100 to a 19. Now everything's even. Are you happy, parents? No, because your kid did the work and others didn't do the work, and they're all being treated equally. That's socialism. There's not one biblical thing in this world about socialism or Marxism or communism. There are three peas in a very bad pod. And listen to this quote from the short handbook of communist ideology. You need to know this. There is no wall between socialism and communism. They are not two different types of society, but two phases of one and the same social formation which differ as to their degree of maturity. That's exactly how Marx himself viewed it. Socialism is an early phase of communism, a transitional period into full communism, and by its very nature, that's the only thing that it can be. You see, in order to bring about this promised socialist utopia, actual humanity and normal human tendencies and sensibilities have to be overcome. And the only way to do that, the only way to make people share when they worked harder than everybody else is to have a large and powerful government to get them to share what they don't want to share. The folks in the USSR, the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, found that out the hard way when they all went into slavery to accomplish this so-called utopia. You say, but preacher, it sounds so good, though. Everybody just living in one big happy commune, putting all their goods in a pile and just having it distributed. What a blessing that would be. How sweet sweet it would be. Well, here's something you ought to know. It was actually tried very early on here in America, and it failed miserably. You know who tried it? Believe it or not, the pilgrims. Listen to a little history lesson that most textbooks omit. You'll find this fascinating. On August the 1st, 1620, a ship called the Mayflower left England with 102 passengers bound for the New World. The manifest included two groups. The separatists, led by William Bradford, had fled their homeland in the oppressive Church of England under King James I in search of a home where they could live and worship God according to their consciences. The strangers sought the new world for other reasons. Together they formed the pilgrims. Their intended crossing to Virginia straight off course, they instead landed on Cape Cod outside the territory covered by their governance. So therefore they had to become responsible for their own governance. Following the nine-week journey, the pilgrims composed an agreement that would establish just and equal laws for all members of the new community. And the revolutionary ideas expressed in the Mayflower Compact were derived from none other than the Bible. Only then, on November 11, 1620, did the pilgrims leave the Mayflower. A cold and barren wilderness awaited them there. There were no friends to greet them, no houses to shelter them, no stores or food to sustain them. That first winter was pretty dangerous and perilous. Half of them died of starvation and exposure. When spring arrived, an Indian named Squanto taught the settlers how to plant corn and fish and use fertilizer and stalk deer. Bradford wrote that Squanto was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond expectations. In October, following their first harvest, Governor Bradford set aside a day of thanksgiving. Squanto, his chief Massasoit, and other members of the tribe were invited to thanksgiving feast. The Indians brought deer and turkeys while the pilgrim women cooked vegetables and fruit pies. The purpose of the feast was not to give thanks to the Indians or Mother Earth, as contemporary history textbooks commonly report, but as a devout expression of gratitude to God. All that gets omitted. But there's something else that gets omitted. And that's that the contract that the pilgrims brokered with their merchant sponsors in London specified that everything they produced had to go into a common store with each member entitled to one common share. In addition, all the land they cleared and the structures they built belonged to the entire community. It was socialism. And it failed 
miserably. William Bradford, the governor of the new colony, realized the futility of collectivism and quickly abandoned the practice. Instead, he assigned a plot of land to each family and permitted them to market their own crops and other products, thereby unleashing the product of free enterprise and the power of free enterprise. What Bradford wisely realized, wisely realized was that these industrious people had no reason to work any harder than anybody else without the motivation of personal incentive. So what can only be called the pilgrim's attempt at socialism ended like all other attempts at socialism in failure. Here's what Bradford later wrote. This is great stuff. The experience that was had in this common course and condition tried sundry years and amongst godly and sober men may well evince the vanity of that conceit of Plato's and other ancients applauded by some of later times that the taking away of property and bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God. For this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. For the young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. A lot of words to say. There's a lot of young guys going, why am I paying for that dude's wife? You see that woman eat? Look at this, man. I'm working like four hours a day to make that man to have, feed that man's wife. This isn't fair. And they stopped working. What happened, though, after collectivism was replaced by capitalism and the concept of private property? Here's what he said. This had very good success, for it made all hands very industrious, so as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could use and saved him a great deal of trouble and gave far better content. The pilgrims soon found they had more food than they could eat. So they set up trading posts and exchanged goods with the Indians. The profits, they realized, allowed them to pay off their debts to the merchants in London. The success and prosperity of the original Plymouth settlement attracted more European settlers, setting off what came to be known as the Great Puritan Migration. People say, but capitalism is just greed. No, it's common sense. What you earn is yours to do with as you please, even if you earn a billion dollars. I'll tell you what greed is. Socialism's greed. The desire to take what someone else has because you're jealous, that's greed. How many of you are familiar with the utterly brilliant Thomas Sowell? Anybody know Thomas Sowell? If you do not know Thomas Sowell, you need to look up and study the works of Thomas Sowell. Most brilliant economist I think the world's ever seen. Thomas Sowell said, what exactly is your fair share of what somebody else has worked for? It's a great question, isn't it? Put bluntly, socialism is a sin and it causes deadly effects. Would you like some numbers? Here's one straight from the history books. 94 million people were slaughtered or starved to death under it and communism just in the 20th century. 94 million people. That's nearly a third of the current population of the United States of America. So don't fall prey to the idea that what people have should be taken away and given to others, be it through confiscatory taxes or forced charity. What it is is stealing, and the effects are absolutely deadly. If this nation becomes a socialist nation, here's what will happen. First of all, your freedom is going to be gone. You will be in slavery. Everybody will be in slavery. There will be a handful of people at the top calling the shots, and you'll do what you're told. Secondly, there will be lack and people will begin to starve just like they have everyone under socialism. Then there will be violence that comes because people are starving. And ultimately, there will be a few people at the top that step in and say, we can fix everything by taking it to the next step. We'll go communist. And millions and millions and millions of people are going to die and this society will fall apart. Socialism is that simple and that sinful. Stay away from it. Speak against it. And young people, don't you ever believe any teacher that says it's a good idea. They have no idea what they're talking about.